here because the room is full anyway. Um, so it will be a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker the, uh, this week. Uh, before I do, I will forget to mention that if you have quite cut short on questions at the end of the seminar, don't worry, there's a wine and cheese reception uh, at four for our speaker today, so you'll, you'll get to uh, ask your questions. So it's a great pleasure to introduce her, Madam Joseph Felton today. Uh, so for the two people in the room who don't know her, uh, so don't feel bad. I'm going to say a few words uh, about her before I let her speak. Uh, so back, Madam Jose, um, did her undergrad and master's uh, work working with Pierre Lejean um, at the University of Montréal. And then she moved to, uh, to do her PhD at, um, at Stony Brook, working with SoCal. Um, and after she got her PhD, well, she did a, a postdoc. But then she let the Canadian universities fight for her. Uh, and that was brutal. So she tried a few ones um, before she, uh, she settled for the University of Toronto, um, where she still is, so they, they won. Um, and so is doing uh, sort of fantastic work in landscape ecology, uh, putting landscape to, as you can see from her titles, to all the other concepts in ecology uh, and, and evolution. Um, so great breadth of, of work and of skills. And she's uh, published many papers, but also published a book that is um, a highly cited book, and she was uh, named highly uh, cited a scientist in 2014. And I'm really happy to say, well, but that's no help. So I will be, Marvel. at least, at last I will be able to read the book, because I just learned it was translated in Chinese. So I'll be able to get a copy and read it for myself. Um, so over to you. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, today um, uh, I have an ambitious uh, program for you all. I'm uh, going to try to present four research that are occurring in my lab. And they will range from special ecology, landscape epidemiology, and landscape genetic. And this should work. Right. So we have seen for some time that space is the next frontier and we have those wonderful papers that have promote such thing. Uh, then people say, well, maybe time is the next frontier. And here we see really how uh, a landscape change in 32 years from uh, forest to uh, uh, agriculture, cattle range, and uh, a very drastic change in Guatemala and Brazil. But I think nowadays we have the know-how to say that the next frontier is space and time. So we have enough data sets that allow us to move to a dynamic system and to look at the changes and how those changes have feedback effect on the processes themselves. So that's bring me to the field of spatial ecology. And the field of spatial ecology is uh, aiming to understand the ecological processes that generate spatial patterns. And once we have this knowledge, we can maybe model those uh, spatial processes and close the book and have more knowledge about spatial ecology and continue to grow our understanding of ecology. Um, so, like I said, I have this ambitious project to talk about four research that have been carried out in my lab. The two first are dealing with spatial ecology per se, looking at modeling species range shift in Ontario. Another study looking at underneath community response to global change, meaning climate and land use change. Then I will move to some kind of spatial temporal state uh, transition index that we developed to look at malaria incidence and I will wrap up things with some genetic connectivity on frog in Colorado. So let's start looking at species range shift. I mean we are knowing that uh, in the area that we have there is chance for moving from one location to another due to different processes and those processes can be regrouped into regional effect filter and local filter effect. At the broader scale, we have these extrinsic uh, processes like climate change and other change, as I mentioned. But there's also dispersal limitation that can uh, limit the ability of moving to new area. And then there's things more local, the weather, the microclimate, the species interaction, and of course, population dynamics. So all those things will affect how a species range can uh, change in the years to come. 
So today I will focus on food and water and here those are the processes that we are going to study in this research. Basically there are broad scale uh, processes that are important, the climate and the land use change, uh, the dispersal, and at the local scale, the population dynamic. So in fact, the goal of this research is to couple uh, large-scale correlative models, uh, such as uh, Maxian, that is a species distribution correlation framework, with more mechanistic population dynamic models of metapopulation. So I will address this in the context of uncertainty. So this is a, a work from my PhD well, she's not my PhD student anymore, Dr. Uh, Nohio Ketis Lewis. Uh, the goal is always to pronounce her name properly. Uh, she just graduated in uh, September and her thesis uh, was surrounding the uncertainty when you couple those species distribution model with more dynamic metapopulation information and see how this will affect the uh, prediction of species range in southern Ontario. So here we are lucky that the hooded wander, it's a very nice bird and the birders knows very well is uh, coming up in southern Ontario, so it's a species that used to be at risk in Ontario, now it's dislisted because the population has increased. And indeed, in uh, the southern part of this range, in the US, it's very abundant and is now moving up in Ontario. And we know the progression, and there is a long term study by uh, Bird Canada uh, that have. Um, follow population. So we have something that is very rare. We have demography at the edge of the species range. So we know the reproduction rate, we know the demography, and we are interested to see, given those shift in uh, climate, what is going to be the expansion of the species in the years to come. So we are combining different model framework because, well, to go in the future, you have to have uh, those species uh, distribution model that account for change in the climate. And those models are known as species distribution model, and the one that I'm going to present is Maxen. And the idea is that the species uh, response is a function of temperature and habitat. So at time one, you see that this is a suitable habitat climate and at time two is expanding and you have to make some very broad, maybe too broad assumption that the model is really uh, accounting for the change in suitability of the habitat and that this is really a proxy for extension and that implicitly we capture all the species processes that are involved. So that's a lot of assumptions. At the other extreme, we have metapopulation, where we are saying as the climate would be better, we have new habitat that can be occupied by the species, but maybe they won't be colonized because of dispersal ability or fluctuation of the uh, vital rate of the population. So we're going to combine those two models and for that, we're going to have a series of simulations. So we have the current climate, then we have the projection of the climate in 2020, 2050, 2080. And we are testing the uncertainty of different general circulation models. Those are four models that are used quite a bit. And we are having, at the end of all this massage of data, a series of suitable active climate habitat maps that is our starting point. To this, we're going to also look at the current habitat of hooded water. So I didn't say that previously, but the hooded water is a species that like to nest in uh, gaps. And they, uh, they put their uh, nest in the shrubby uh, vegetation about one meter from the ground. So the type of habitat that you need is kind of a deciduous forest that has this kind of gap dynamic. So the habitat as succession of the forest will go, you will lose habitat just by the fact that the forest will regrow. So we are going to implement a loss of habitat through the simulation time. 
So we are now going to have a series of patches throughout the analysis. And we have our parameters of the demography that we can put into a metapopulation model. And all of that will predict to us where is the parameter that affect more the extinction rates of the population. So the idea is very to couple those two things together. And to make a story short, here's the punchline. So based on all those simulations, based on all those different parameters, what we can see is that here in gray we have the parameters that are for the uh, demography information. So children of survival, adult survival, fecundity, dispersal, <coughs> survival, so on and so forth. And in white is more the habitat, so the number of patches, the number of connection, the ability of dispersal, the different type of circulation model, etc., etc. And this is the ranking that came about of uh, uh, the parameter that influenced most the extension rate of the uh, species, the wooded water. So the first four were very just demography, so to account for metapopulation is definitely crucial. And the fourth one and fifth one was more the habitat. So this is a case where when people use only the species distribution model, you miss the crucial parts to explain the expansion of the species. But this is 20 years in the simulation. What about this 100 years in the simulation? So here what we see is there is a change in those uh, ranking, but not for the four first one. So in 20 years or 100 years, those four parameters of three for the uh, demography are crucial and then habitat. And then things are moving. And what you can see is that the circulation models that were ranked nine after 20 years, so there's not much diversion. Mm -hmm. After 100 years, those diversion of the modeling framework of temperature very goes in different direction, and there are rank uh, move up to fifth. So now we see that this climate envelope are starting to have influence in a long time period. So the take home message of this research is that when we have only circulation model, we are maybe missing the crucial factors that affect the demography that influence species range. So to conclude this, we see that Maxen in this case, that was the model we use, over predict uh, the uh, range expansion, that the meta population, the demographic parameter were crucial for the expansion, and that the limitation of habitat was uh, very crucial. So fragmentation, land use change is affecting the ability of the species to move up. So now I would like to move from, I would say, more a uh, simulation uh, uh, dimension to a more fieldwork dimension where the same question were asked but with real data of uh, dragonflies and uh, that's why you switch French and English to mm -hmm. just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it will come back, but demoiselle. Damn, don't fly. Thank you. <laughs> That's where suddenly your brain just cannot cope with the languages. Uh, so basically, this is a work of uh, my PhD student, uh, Aaron uh, All, and this is in collaboration with Dan Berg and Rafael. And we were interested in sh seeing in the field how the land use change and the climate change affect the community of uh, colonies. So we know that the biodiversity is threatened by the loss of habitat, and if the habitat is rare, it's more threatened. And there may be uh, something true also about the species that need specific habitat. So if you need aquatic uh, ecosystem and terrestrial, one of them maybe will be damaged more than the other, destroyed more, so you may be more affected if you need both habitat. So this is why we select odonate, because they are... Uh, uh, so here's what's written. That's why you write things down. Uh, uh, the uh, larvae of the dragonflies are in the ponds, and then their 
and though life is in the terrestrial, in the forest adjacent to the ponds, and they have some kind of key um, role in the ecosystem that they are nasal predator both when they are larvae and when they are adult. So it doesn't seem like a very charismatic species, but in the food web they have a kind of very useful role and they are present in the ecosystem is a good indication of the health of the environment. So here to study this community uh, composition change through times, we are looking at different processes. So here we are looking <coughs> at the climate change, again, a broad scale, land use change. We are going to look at connectivity in the term of uh, dispersal ability of the dragonflies and how the weather, so here I make really a distinction between climate and weather. So the climate is those big models and the weather is daily precipitation, daily uh, temperature. And the, oops, sorry, and the temperature uh, is at the site level. And then our response is the community. So our goal was to determine the relative importance of the effect of land use and climate change in the uh, larvae and adult ordinate community. So we are used to see those two things. That's what we did in the previous study. But now we are going to have ways to maybe look at the interaction between climate change and land use. And the question we have is how the species will respond to that. So there's different possibility response. The first one is that it's going to be additive. So that uh, one factor, the climate increase and the land use change will favor the expansion of the range of some species and increase the diversity. So this is an additive kind of possibility response. There's the antagonistic possibility that one will increase, so the climate will favor more habitat, but by having removed uh, area by habitation or degradation or in many different ways, we're going to lose some habitat like we have with the hooded water. So then it is, we won't see the expansion as we were, would be expecting. And then there's the synergy that then now an increase of diversity or decrease uh, or an increase in range or contraction could be due to the interaction between the climate change and the, use, the land use that remove habitat. So in this case, we will have that 1 plus 1 equal 3 or minus 3, so the, it's not additive. So the question we have is, can we distinguish between those three? And that's not an easy task. So to do this, we sample, we exclude the person who is But I went to the sites, but I did sample. So uh, Dan Bird and uh, Aaron All did the, the survey in 2002 was done with the, the Denver and it was a design of having 60 ponds that were selected around Ottawa region and Gatineau. So there was kind of a same size of about five uh, hectares of ponds where we had selected about 30 that were natural and 30 that were man-made and you're going to say she must have had uh, something to drink because that doesn't add up to uh, 60 so I show you 23 and 24. <laughs> so basically what happened is that in 2012 uh, not all the 61 ponds could be found. So four had no access so I think Dan Bird was able to cross fence and Aaron did not want to cross fence. Um, four could not be found because of the GPS resolution was not good and six were completely destroyed. So the land use change uh, was such that six of them disappeared. So we end up with 47 sites where community of uh, adults were surveyed 40 minutes and the larvae was uh, sampled in the ponds and identified in the lab. There were two survey per well, in 2002 and 2012 at the beginning of June and at the beginning of July. So uh, basically with this we had 10 years separation 
And we were able to use the remove kind of a land use change uh, by looking at aerial photographs and then um, maps that uh, show us the land cover types. So we did some kind of two buffers. So 50 meter around the pond was kind of the local information and a 500 meter that gave us the kind of different type of habitat. So this is two ponds, one in more a urban setting and one in more in a rural setting. So you can see more vegetation and here more residential roads, etc. So we quantified those amounts and we compute the difference between 2002 and 2012. So this is the difference uh, between uh, our buffers of 500 meters around each pond. So what we can see is that there was a decrease of area of wetland, decrease of water, decrease of vegetation was very striking, increase of road, increase of residential area, amazing. Uh, open area that's more um, feel, uh, so that was also lost quite a bit, an increase of industrial and development. So we can quantify this change in only 10 years in the Ottawa region. So this is just to illustrate uh, those changes visually where they were. So we can see now, so these are some kind of rough estimate we kind of try to uh, characterize classify them in three categories, the uh, lost of uh, habitat, sometimes there was gain of habitat, and sometimes there was nothing changing. So we use the mean and standard deviation of one, uh, standard deviation as a cutting point. And what we can see is that uh, uh, the wetland, there was some uh, gain and some loss, so there was not much change. The open area, a lot of loss around Ottawa, a little bit of gain, and we get to you know industrial, we have some gain in um, Ottawa and outside, uh, commercial in the suburban, vegetation inside uh, uh, Ottawa and gets more definitely, road increase and commercial increase. So we see that their spatial pattern vary depending on where we are in those uh, land use change. Then we have climate change. So we took the uh, Environment Canada data sets, and those data sets uh, can give you this kind of 30 years average. So we use uh, the information of 10 years difference. So because we had 10 years between our sample, we were saying that we want to see what is the difference <coughs> of uh, the sample in 2012 to 2002. But the, the data was uh, for long term that I said was from those Disney, so we took 2010, 2090, and, uh, and we compared the difference of the 10 previous year in the change of climate. So that gives us two types of window of change, so from 2000 to uh, 1999, 2010 to 2000. And then we used the real weather of the year, so we look at what was the weather condition, precipitation, <coughs> temperature in the year where the sample were done, and uh, we went back in time to three months prior to the sampling to have some kind of the um, growing period and emergent periods of the other days. So we have two types of climatic information, changes and weather. So here is the uh, climate change data. So if we compare 2000 and 2010 differences, this is yearly. So those are differences in, uh, on average um, over those 30 years period. So what we see here is that uh, it's very small differences, but uh, a difference of 0.1 versus 0.3 is significant because we have 30 years of data to see that this is really occurring. So it doesn't look much, but it is. So this is yearly for the whole year, and then if we break down per season, what we can see that in the first period of time, they were kind of a little bit in the same ball game, except winter was a little bit larger. But in 2010, we see that winter temperature had increased of 4.8 degrees, which is quite a bit. 
And that's, uh, you know, our ferry that live in Avala was able to attest that, that indeed, it seemed that the winters are warmer. So this is something that there's really a signal that maybe winter is going to affect different property of the other day, the emerging times, the uh, growing season, so on and so forth. So just to see that visually, what we have here, this is the yearly average information. So the scale here is very um, 0.2 degree uh, intervals. So we see more uh, downtown Ottawa, Gatineau, and the suburban area. And this is by spring, so not much difference. Uh, summer 2012 was uh, very, what, the period 2010, sorry, was very cooler in the west than in the north, so that's very uh, strange uh, differences. And then we have the fall, and finally the winter is not even in the same scale, so now we have to have another scale, so this is where we have this almost five degree difference in. 2010. So something is really happening to the climate and that was for the entire region. So to capture the species response, we computed two different matrix. We looked at Shannon diversity index, uh, where we did a multiple regression looking at the main factors separately and their interactions between climate and land use. And then we have an ordination technique to look at the species themselves response. So just to give you some number, in 2002, we had uh, 63 species, and in 2012, we had 66. The coverage is quite good, so that was uh, something that made us confident that we had comparable sampling methods, so we were not completely off from one period to another. And overall, if we look at the diversity of the two years combined, we had uh, 25 species of larvae, uh, 34 adult and 24 of them were the same species. So we have some kind of increase of species, maybe we lost some, so there's kind of fluctuation, so we wanted to ex explore a little bit more of that. And what we found is that, in fact, two species were not there in 2002. So they have expanded their range uh, in the area in the 10-year period, so those are the two beautiful Latin name that you can read for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically their dispersal range was like 6.5 for the first one and 18 uh, kilometer per year. So they really are expanding in this area. Then we look at the Shannon Diversity Index and uh, for the larvae and then for the adult. And here we uh, just summarize the information of the regression that just did R square. Those are average of the best AIC the two, uh, two units of delta AIC. So we have a few models for the adult that were the best one, a few models for the larvae. And these are the interactions that we found that were significant. So we found that for the adult, uh, there was an impact of the fall uh, temperature that was an interaction with the road and the residential area. The same thing with the winter. So basically, warmer period and the downtown maybe area where there's more uh, road and more residential and uh, those have positive effect. And for the larvae, we see maybe some kind of effects with the winter climate, so there can be uh, better success of emergence. Uh, the impact of the industry, so maybe warmer region, the fall, and the Peruvia. So you see that there's been some interaction between those factors. That was in 2002. In 2012, well, our winter was the winter winner for the adult. It was really the most impact, important factor in interaction with the industry. And for the larvae, we see that the summer, where they have maybe a longer growing season, was important, and the loss of wetland vegetation and the increase of residential. So those uh, relationships uh, seem to tell us that there is some interaction that is holding, and that uh, species are responding to those changes. Here is just to uh, tease you with the ordination. Um, 
be because there are 63 species, I didn't want to have to put them all. Uh, would have been an overkill, but I just want to show you the response of the ponds in the uh, ordination space. And what we can see first, our ordination are not as good as we would have liked. Uh, it's very low uh, fit, although significant with the larvae. And what we can see is that basically the uh, square is the pond that are man-made are more affected by the climate in the fall and the adult are more affected by the in the natural setting by the uh, amount of wetlands and in the industrial place by the uh, sorry the um, human made by the industrial and the uh, climate in the winter similar tendency not as clear for the larvae in 2012 but we see that the Year temperature affect more the ponds that have uh, been made by humans. And here we see the adult response definitely of the amount of road residence and the temperature. So I think we were able to see differences and response to both land use and climate. So the temperature in winter was really the most striking change that we found that will affect the larvae survival, the early emergence, and longer flight season, so that can favor the species range expansion. For the land use, well, we have really this kind of residential development single, mostly in Gatineau, so that's mean that we have loss of habitat and maybe homogenization of the species pool. And in our quest of saying is what is the interaction between climate change and land cover, I think we find something that is more antagonistic because at the same time that two species arrive in the areas, they were able to track the climatic envelope change. 